actors. Now, here is an example of what a film frame looks like. This is a frame from a film. If you see, there is some ghost of an image that you are seeing over here. This is what a film reel actually uh, looks like. It's, it's like four frames from a reel. Now, if you notice that this, this image and this image, if you look at it, is not really too different. The reason that they don't look too different is because the interval that you have between the two images, the difference in the content of the two images cannot be too much. Because if the gap is too much, then the image will jump. Because your mind will then start reading that as an individual image. So what is the trick? The trick is the content should vary very little. Enough to have some movement, but not so much that it becomes a jerky movement. It should be smooth movement. So I'm going to show you now for all of uh, all of you who are, you know, more, all of you are students here. Some of you are also teachers. And... Uh, Somewhere we have this impression in our minds that, you know, animation is for children. Uh, and, uh, you know, cartoons means, oh, it's all kiddie stuff. It's for little babies and little children to keep them busy. Uh, nothing can be further than the truth. Animation is such a powerful medium of education. It's such a powerful medium that you can use in the teaching process, uh, in the teaching learning process, because a couple of things work in its favor which, uh, you know, books and normal, regular or old standard ways of teaching cannot compete with. First and foremost, what works in its favor is that it is a visual medium. It's a medium which people will enjoy engaging with because there are there is movement happening on the screen. What did your mummy do when you were a little child? You know, when you're creating too much of a you know racket in the house, she'd put on the TV and tell you, sit here quietly. And what do you do? You sit glued to the television screen watching your cartoons. That's a trick she used. All right. Now you know. Because you are distracted as a little child, you are distracted by the movement of the images, by the movement on the screen. So anything that is visual for us, visual stimulation for us or visual input for us always becomes that much more exciting and engaging. Rather than giving you, you know, a book to read, or standing in front of you and giving you a lecture. Because after a point in time, it gets boring. You know, your eyes start shutting and your mind starts shutting down. And you say, what is this going on again? Same thing. You know, madam is going on and on. Sir is going on and on. It's not really getting very exciting. So what are we using now in today's date and time? Newer ways of teaching are coming in. Newer ways of engagement are coming in. We want to engage with young minds in a manner that the young mind is able to respond quickly is able to assemble information, is able to grasp information easily. And animation allows you that power. Animation allows you the ability to do that because you can play a lot with animation. There is a lot that you can do in animation. In fact, you can do anything in animation. That's the biggest statement I can make. You can't shoot a person dead in live action and then you know have him wake up and start walking. That's not going to happen. Once he's dead, he's dead. He's gone. But in animation, you can drive a road roller over a guy and he will get up. Because he's an animated character. He's a drawing. A drawing that is brought to life, but a drawing that does not have life in itself. So animation allows you to do a lot of things which live action does not allow you to do. You can, uh, let's say, for instance, blow up a house. And if it doesn't look nice, you just erase a couple of drawings and you draw them again and the explosion looks a little better. If you don't like that again, draw, erase a few more drawings and keep working on those drawings till you get the right kind of an explosion. But you can't do that with live action. You can't take a house, rig it up with explosives, blow it up and then say, oh, that didn't look good. Let's do it again. You have to rebuild the house again. You'll have to redo that entire exercise again. But what does an animator do? An animator plays God. He can, with a stroke of a pencil, give life. With a stroke of a pencil, he can take life. With a stroke of a pencil, he can create anything that he likes. He can create water. He can create fire. He can create wind. You know, he can create flowers. He can create, uh, you know, dogs and animals and cats and what have you. Just with the power of the pencil. So 
using this power what do we do with education how do we how do we push this towards education i'm going to show you two short films and this is specially for you know the young minds here as well as for the teachers in the group that it will give you an idea of the power of this medium and how you can employ for let's say a subject like we are going to talk about a, a subject like chemistry here something that i know a lot of students run away from science is another subject that a lot of students run away from purely because of one it's a complicated subject and it requires a a very highly skilled uh, you know exchange of knowledge in a very highly skilled manner to keep the audience captivated not everybody can do it not everybody is a good science teacher i mean you may be brilliant with your knowledge but it takes a very special kind of a, a person to be able to explain that in a manner that the students or the audience doesn't get bored so let's take a look at the small film over here and i'm sure you'll appreciate this uh, you know of what it does today students we're going to learn about oxygen element number 8 atomic mass 16 and an ambitious young student in element theory school it's time for recess let's observe as oxygen tries to make friends on the playground here's helium all alone on the carousel not having much luck is he perhaps oxygen can give him a hand see that students oxygen repels helium much like a magnet Hmm. Looks as though helium has gone off to play somewhere else. Seems here that oxygen has made friends with iron. It's unfortunate, however, that they won't be able to play on that seesaw for long, since oxygen causes most metals to rust. I think someone should get the nurse. Oxygen has recovered quickly from his little bump and can now be seen playing with barium. But they should be careful playing in that rocket since oxygen is often used as ignition in engines. <laughs> Curiously enough, barium is also used in fireworks, which produce a brilliant green hue. Don't be sad, oxygen. Maybe hydrogen can be your friend. See, nothing bad will happen. That is, unless a second one jumps in. That's it for oxygen. Be sure to watch our next lesson where we investigate the effects of helium in the upper atmosphere. suddenly we have some interest in chemistry we suddenly want to figure out you know all these elements and we want to look at uh, you know how various different elements react to each other this is uh, using the power of uh, animation along with building a story uh, around uh, you know an element that we have uh, and and presenting it in a manner which will one be visually exciting for uh, students to see and uh, how you structure the story how you present the story how you use the uh, you know the medium of uh, uh, you know animation it's entirely up to you because like i said you once you know that you can draw various things and you can draw just about anything it's up to you as to how you're going to exploit the medium to tell your story and to get your subject across I'm going to show you another film over here, which is now a slightly more advanced film. is something that we use every day in our lives. Uh, it is when we type on our computers and we use these various different what we call fonts, uh, which is again is it's the uh, you know incorrect terminology. It's it it is uh, the correct terminology is not font. It is typeface. Uh, font is actually a family of typefaces. That is the correct word. But common language, everybody says, I want to use this font. I want to use that font. Well, you don't use a font; you use a typeface. 
so here is a is, is a lovely picture or a lovely film uh, that explains the history of typefaces and i always find this very exciting to look at because a lot of people don't know you know how typefaces were developed you can when you are using computers today you you know you are using your, on your cell phone you are typing something you have a keyboard and there are letters written in different styles now these are typefaces and you have the choice to change the typeface uh, you know it, it can be a funny typeface it can be a serious typeface it can be a you know a, a very classy contemporary typeface so how did all of that come about this is a short educational film again using the power of animation but now in a different way in a different style in a different technique so uh, let's take a look at this one well let me play this full screen just give me one second it will be easier for all of you to uh, you know see it in full screen just give me one second i'll just set it up to play full screen Type is power. The power to express words and ideas visually. It's timeless, but always changing. And that's what we're going to explore. Most people agree that the creator of typography was a German man named Johannes Gutenberg, and yes, he wore a hat like that. Before Gutenberg came along and revolutionized the world of communication, books needed to be scribed by hand, usually by monks, which was very time-consuming and expensive. So Gutenberg created black letter, the first ever typeface modeled after the writing of the scribes. Black letter has thick vertical lines and thin horizontal connectors, which made it great for scribing, but it looked very dense and squished together when printed. Something needed to change. Enter Roman type. This particular typeface is Cambria, which you're probably used to seeing on your word processor. But the first ever Roman typeface was created in the 15th century by the Frenchman Nicholas Jensen. This is his typeface right here. Jensen worked mainly in Venice, Italy, and was inspired by the lettering found on ancient Roman buildings. His letter forms were based on straight lines and regular curves. This made them very clear and legible compared to the dense darkness of black letter. This legible new typeface was an instant success and quickly spread across Europe, riding on the coattails of the Renaissance. The next major innovation in typography after Roman letters was italics, which are like slanted and stylized versions of Roman type. They were created in the late 15th century by Aldus Minutius from Italy as a way of fitting more letters onto the page and saving money. Now we use italics interspersed in Roman type for emphasis. Aldus Minutius also created the modern comma and semicolon, but that's another story. Type development stayed fairly stagnant until the 18th century in England when William Caslon created a typeface that set a new standard for legibility. While it wasn't anything radical, it was just what the world was looking for. The style of Caslon's typeface is now referred to as Old Style. A few decades later, another Brit named John Baskerville created a new variety of typeface, which we call Transitional. Later still, a Frenchman named Didot and an Italian named Bodoni created typefaces that we have classified as modern. Most serif typefaces fit into one of these three categories, but what does each category mean? An Old Style typeface has letters that have thick serifs, and low contrast between thick and thin strokes. A transitional typeface has letters with thinner serifs and a higher contrast between thick and thin strokes. And a modern typeface has letters with very thin serifs and extreme contrast between thick and thin strokes. Next, William Caslon's great-grandson, named William Caslon IV, got sick of all of these serifs, so he decided to remove them entirely and made a new kind of typeface, called a sans serif. It didn't catch on immediately, but would eventually get really big. During the second industrial revolution, advertising created a need for new typefaces. Letters were made taller and wider, mainly used in large sizes on posters and billboards. Things got 
pretty weird, but one happy result of all of this experimentation is Egyptian, or slab serif. It has really thick serifs and is usually used for titles. As a backlash to the complexity found in typefaces of the 19th century, the early 20th century brought something simple. Paul Renner from Germany created a typeface called Futura, and it was based on simple geometric shapes. This is called the geometric sans. Around the same time, a British man named Eric Gill created a typeface called Gill Sans that was similar to a geometric sans, but with gentler, more natural curves, and this is called a humanist sans. The next major step in the world of sans serifs happened in Switzerland in 1957 with the introduction of Helvetica. It has simple curves and is available in many different weights, and some would call it the world's favorite typeface. The world of typography changed forever with the introduction of the computer. There were a few difficult years of crude pixel type due to the primitive screen technology. But then technology evolved and computers began to allow for the creation of thousands of beautiful typefaces. And the odd, um, dud. But now anyone has the freedom to create their own unique typeface. And that is the history of typography. So, did you enjoy that? I'm sure a lot of you never knew what typeface is and how these names that you see of the types that you find in your uh, word processing programs. All these are very familiar names, Caslon, Baskerville, uh, you know, Bodoni. These, these are all, uh, you know, things that you see every day, but you never reflect back and say, well, where did this come from? So a perfect example, now this is all animation. It's all been done frame by frame. This, this style of animation is called cutout animation, where what they do is that they have basically taken a piece of paper and they have using a scissor, they've cut out these various shapes of the letters and frame by frame what they are doing is that they are placing these letters in position and shooting the images. And then when they play it back for you, you get this movement of various different things that are happening and you find, oh wow, this is so interesting. It's such an exciting way to understand a subject of typography, which uh, normally if I were to explain this subject of typography to you, I would probably be giving you a lecture with, you know, some stuff written on a whiteboard. And I can pretty much assure you that in the first, after the first five minutes, you'll probably go off to sleep because it's, it's not a very, I mean, unless you make it interesting visually, things start moving around on the screen and you see, you know, a letter A running from one side and coming to the other or switching in front of you. Unless you see that kind of interesting, uh, you know, uh, trickery or magic, uh, the attention is not held for very long. So moving on forward from here, I'll come back to, uh, you know, a couple of examples of films later on. But uh, this is something that I want, I want to take a look at this. This is a very, uh, we don't want to get too much into the technicalities of this aspect, but understand one thing that this whole concept of playing back in rapid succession that we were talking about, taking still images and playing them back in rapid succession, there has to be a standard, uh, a set number uh, of frames that you should be playing back. Uh, what is the number of frames that you should play back so that I see movement? And that is 24 frames for every one second. So if I have to see one second, only one second of footage uh, of, of movement on the screen, I must have 24 frames. In video, it is 25 frames. Well, just for the purpose of argument or for purpose of explanation, uh, I, let's stick to 24 right now because this is the traditional format of film. The, remember the film strip I showed you on top? Uh, when we used to shoot on film, 24 frames was a standard that was established. Now, what is a standard? A standard is a rule that is established where everybody follows it. So that entire technology, the, the shooting, the playback, the display, the viewing experience can have some sort of commonality in it. If you don't have a standard, then it becomes very difficult to generate that same experience. So what 
the industry decided or what people decided over a period of time is that 24 frames is going to be the standard rate for flip for playback. Now remember this, the playback rate is constant. It cannot change. It is fixed. You cannot play back at a different rate than 24. Technically you can, but I'm not going to get into that. That is a little more advanced subject. Newer technology has come in where we can vary all that, but let's, let's keep that aside. For the time being, understand this, that this is a rule. You cannot play back at anything but 24 frames per second. Yes, I can see some comments and I have just said that, that you, you cannot play back at anything beyond a certain playback rate because newer technology, different technologies allow for changes in playback rate. Why I want to tell you that the playback rate is constant at either 24 for a film, 25 for video, also 30 for video. It is possible. You can play back with the newer technology even at 60 frames per second in uh, you know the latest technology that is there. But you're not going to get too much of success in trying to show those films because theaters are not ex uh, you know equipped to uh, you know uh, play back at that speed. You have to have specialized equipment to be able to play back at that speed, which is why I want to keep the discussion fixed at 24 or 25 frames per second, which is the standard across the world right now in film technology. Because your playback rate is fixed, it means that you can only display at a certain speed. You can't go beyond that speed. But here is the catch. You can record at whatever speed you want. So I can record at a slower speed or I can record at a faster speed, which means that to record one second, I can record at maybe 500 frames a second, which means that 500 frames will get recorded in that one second duration. Or I can record at 12 frames per second, which means that in one second, only 12 frames will get recorded but my playback is still at 25. The playback does not change. This is what gives birth to the whole concept of slow motion or fast motion. Because understand it, let's draw a very simple analogy. Let's take a classroom. And there is a rule. The rule is that from that classroom, you can only send student out in batches of 25. You can't send 24, you can't send 26. You can't send 10 out at a time. You can only send 25 out at a time. Now, imagine if I have 50 students in the class. That means I'm going to send them out in two batches of 25 each. First 25 will go out, then the next 25 will go out, right? If I have only 12 in the class, what will happen? I can't send them out unless I grab 12 more students from the next class and make a batch of 25 and send them out. Now, what if I have 500 students in the class? It's going to take a lot of time for these students to empty out the class because 25, then 25, then 25, then 25, 20 batches will have to go out. So here is where the difference is. When you have, when you are pushing in 500 students, that means you are recording at a very high speed, but your playback is still 25 frames. So it's going to take a long time for all that you have recorded to come out. So the motion becomes slow. It takes a lot more time for the action to be completed. And the inverse is true. If I have less number of people inside, it will take me less time to get them out quickly. So this is what slow motion and fast motion photography. And this is, a, this is a concept which I was surprised to learn. A lot of people get confused with because as in the comments just now, somebody said, I can record at, you know, 60 frames. Yes, you can. You can record at 100,000 frames a second. You can record at 500,000 frames a second. Nothing is stopping you from recording at that speed. Camera and technology exist today where you can record at very high speeds. Let me show you an example. Take a look at this.
This is extremely high speed photography. Very high speed recording has been done. And see the net result when you're playing it back. Now I actually counted the number of seconds in this in this film. You can probably see it on the screen. It's a 26 second long film. 26 seconds long. Have you ever shot an arrow at a balloon? Try it. Don't poke yourself in the eye, please. All you youngsters, do it under supervision. But you will notice that if you ever burst a balloon using a pin, it bursts even before your eyes can see what has happened. It's a split second number. One minute it's there, next second it's gone. Poop, gone. All the water is out. You don't see what has happened. It's just you have the balloon in your hand and suddenly you have water in your hand. You don't register it. So how do we now see what is happening? What we do is that we break that action down into many separate pieces. Remember when we talked about if you take a sequence of images and you break it down, now here we are breaking down this sequence into many images. So it's taking us longer to capture the action. But the playback rate is the same. We can only see 25 frames every second. So what is happening? It's taking longer for us to see what has happened actually. And which is why you get such clarity in the way the, uh, you know, the, the balloon bursts. So the faster your recording speed, the slower the playback is going to be. So all the films that you see, where you pe see people running in slow motion like that, they run like that in front of you and they come and they're dancing or they jump and they do and the action is very slow. They are shooting at very high speed. They're running the camera at breakneck speed and they're recording the action because they know when they play it back, it will still play back 25 frames every second. So what's going to happen? Something that took me one second in playback to go from here to here is now going to probably take 10 seconds. So the action will become like this. Because I have that many more frames to capture. That's what I've done. I've recorded that many more frames to capture this movement. So this frame rate number that we have is, is, a, is a very, very important aspect that we use in uh, moving picture technology. Now animators, because they are drawing, they have complete freedom to draw as many frames as they like. So if they want to draw action, which is slow, they have to draw many more frames. And if they have to draw action that is fast, then they draw less number of frames. Because for a bullet to move from here to here, it's going to move at some lightning speed. You're not even going to be able to see it. So that's it. It's gone. Did you see my hand? Did you see the position of my hand? You didn't. I'm moving the hand left to right. You, you can't even make out that my hand is. You just see a blur. It's moving so fast. But if I want to see the action, what do I do? I slow it down. I slow down the action. Now you can see it. What am I doing? I am still traveling the same distance from here to here. But I'm taking more time to cover that distance. Which means I am now dividing those frames into many smaller bits and recording it. So I'm probably recording five seconds. And it plays back slowly. But if I record 500 frames and I record the same action, this is going to now take a very long time because there are 500 frames that are being have to be used up before I reach the edge of the frame. There are 500 intervals here. So this is a very, it's, this is the simplest way in which I can explain this concept to you. Don't fret or, over it if you don't understand it. Don't get confused if you don't understand it. It's a complicated subject. Uh, Amitabha will tell you that, you know, some very highly accomplished filmmakers also don't understand it even in their advanced years. That what is high speed and what is low speed and how does it make a difference. But just remember this, anytime you see slow motion, on frame and you see some you know actor doing a slow movement like that running across the beach in a very slow motion remember this they've shot it at very high speed that's what they have done 
so i'll show you an example this is this is uh, my beautiful face uh, turning this is one second of footage playing back at a very at at only 12 frames like the 12 frames that we showed you but the playback is still 25 frames what happens in normal playback you see the difference one is normal turn of head this one is slightly faster because there are less number of frames but the playback is happening at the same rate same thing here the head turning this is normal speed normal speed here less number of frames here so what happens the head turns in a jerky movement it moves fast it turns fast so this is something that we use again as animators this is technology of moving pictures that is being used and here is where animation comes into play and how we can use animation to create interest in showing stuff which you can't do in live action this is the genie from aladdin see how is he's got a zipper on his mouth you can't do this in live action see how his mouth is turning the shapes are turning you know there is a lot of stretches that are happening in his facial characteristics you can't do this in live action this is what animation allows you to do take a look at this on the left hand side this is charlie chaplin why do these this move why does this movie move so fast because in the older days we were not working with 24 frames per second we were working with a different frame rate but today we are playing back those films in 24 frames per second so it becomes faster the action looks a little unnatural it looks very fast look at tom and jerry all of you must be watching tom and jerry this is power of animation for you see where his hand is his hand is still playing the banjo but his arm has gone around her you can't do this in live action you can't create something like this in live action this is the beauty of what drawings allow you to do so once i know that it is got to be a series of drawings once i know that i have a fixed speed at which the drawings have to play back then i can draw what i like how i like make it interesting in whichever way and people will be glued to the screen they'll be glued to the you know the they to watch you what you are showing them here is an example of how we used to shoot films in the earlier days this is a a still frame camera this is how big the camera you know setup used to be and that's a movement of a person moving or walking 25 frames a walk cycle has been created multiple drawings 25 drawings to show a person walking frame by frame okay some more examples i'll show you here are examples of a walk with personality with action with some sort of character you can see they are all walking but they are walking in different ways the body movement is different you've got this fellow who looks like a thug you know walking on the left turn screen he's got this attitude in his body that he's walking with this one over here is a lazy walk you know he's walking in a very lazy fashion sure yeah just go through two uh, thoughts uh, you know which i want sure. to share with sure. you sure sure which sure. is that one of the things that artists or you as an artist or somebody who wants to create interesting stuff one of the things that you have to keep in mind is to observe uh, the reason why certain things look different is because of the way that they are structured which means what is their weight what is their shape what is the how much of uh, uh, what what do they look like external appearance so wood looks very different from metal and the reason it looks different is because of the way light plays on it we remember we talked about light viewing device object so if you look at this drawing that is that the illustration or the movement that you're seeing over here of different types of balls that are jumping that are bouncing over here you can pretty much make out what these independent balls must be made of of there is a spongy ball there is a heavy ball there is a tennis ball uh, there is a beach ball because of the way that they are bouncing you can feel the weight of the ball here this is all illustration it's all drawing there is no live action here so when you draw in a certain way you have to be aware of what is it that you are trying to portray if you want to portray a heavy ball the ball will not bounce that much but if i take a soft rubber ball it will bounce a lot now this explains to me the difference between the composition of the ball or the material of the ball rubber is different from metal 
because rubber will bounce metal will not bounce so an artist has to be very clear about these things when they are drawing and creating animation because that is what will bring life into their drawings if you want to show a, a basketball a basketball will behave very differently than a cricket ball which will behave very differently than a tennis ball you can try it at home take a rubber ball and take a cricket ball or take a basketball or take a football and bounce it on the ground don't break anything in your house please bounce it on the ground and see a cricket ball may not jump up that much a tennis ball will jump up a lot more a basketball may jump up a little differently because of the material that it is made up of and this is what as artists we try to understand observe and then use it in our drawings to give the drawings character to give the drawings life to make the audience or the viewer understand what is the material i'm talking about so if a rubber ball starts behaving i look at it it looks like a football but it behaves like a tennis ball i will not believe it i'll say something is wrong over here this ball is not bouncing correctly so if a cricket ball starts bouncing like a let's say a football you're going to say no there's something wrong here so as an artist i have to draw in order to be able to capture the personality of what i am trying to show so this is i mean just to end up here again finishing off with animation uh, anything is possible like i said it is a very safe medium uh, you don't get hurt you don't get burnt you don't drown under water uh, you know you don't uh, kill yourself uh, with animation anything is possible you can so long as you can draw you can create life you can give life to you know in even inanimate objects so uh, another advantage that animation has is that we when we look at something in animation we already have accepted the fact that this is not going to be real this is going to be make believe so half of the conv convincing has already been done you never watch a, an animated film like lion king or jungle book and question how come a, a, a lion is talking or how come a cheetah is talking or how come a, a bear is talking you never question that you sit there and you look at what they are doing you enjoy the chimpanzee and the orangutan you know talking in english which school did they go to you don't question that who taught them how to talk like human beings you don't question that why because you are watching an animation film the medium itself is telling you this is make believe but here is where the trick comes in if the make believe is not convincing then the animation will not look nice so even in the make believe you have to be a little careful you have to convince the audience a little more because as it is they know that what you are going to show them is not real it's all drawing it's all painting it's an illusion so i'm going to finish with that we'll open it up to question and uh, amitabh uh, if somebody wants to moderate it we could uh, you know take it forward from there uh, yes so yes sir good afternoon so uh, i think aditi has already a list of questions that uh, some of our participants have asked Uh, so we will start right. with what we have, and then as more questions okay. come in, we can uh, uh, we can bring them on. And uh, if there are certain participants who wish to speak to you on video live, we could uh, highlight them. Uh, so yeah, over sure. to over sure, to sure, Aditi. Sure. So let me just stop my let me stop my screen share so that sure. then I have like a bigger screen to talk to everybody with. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Aditi. Yes. Hello, so thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Hi. and I think we have uh, quite a buzz in the chat. Uh, so our first question is uh, from Manjuri, and she asks, "How did you get into animation? What inclined you to?" Ah. <laughs> what did what what uh, excited me to get into animation? Well, I I think it was more to do with I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. Uh, that's the simplest way to put it. i was not interested in uh, getting into an academic career in terms of that you uh, know you must understand that in art is uh, you know doctor engineer chartered accountant regular fields art was never considered to be a serious field and uh, if you said that you want to become an artist the common uh, understanding was bhooka marega you know he is not going to earn enough to feed himself but uh, there is a, you know there is always a desire and a passion uh, that people have and i guess my desire and my passion was to do something different i didn't want to get into the regular streams so uh, i had had a slight introduction to you know some sort of animation which i didn't even know that this is animation at that point in time 
and uh, i said yeah that looks interesting uh, what is that let's just try and find out and i was lucky that i uh, you know my parents were very supportive uh, which is very very important we have to allow children to uh, you know follow their dreams uh, we guide them uh, we show them direction but we don't live our lives through them you have to allow them to live their lives and that's what my parents did they said well whatever you want to do there is only one condition that we have for you and that is you have to give it your best do it with 100% conviction uh, because then you can look at yourself in the eye and say yes i gave it all that it was you know all that was uh, within my power to do so i got excited about animation i was lucky that i got a break with uh, you know one of the most wonderful studios in india and one of the few studios in india that was working in animation uh, digital animation technology at that point in time i had fantastic mentors uh, possibly the reason why i decided to become a teacher myself and wanted to interact because i loved the way i was taught and i really understood uh, you know the power of teaching uh, that it, it is not enough to know a subject if you know a subject well good for you the the fun the real payback is that when you can actually explain the subject to somebody in a manner that they understand it so uh, i have always tried to keep this as a guiding rule for myself that if i can get the slowest learner to understand what i am saying i don't have to worry about the fast learners i know they'll get it so the biggest challenge for me is how i was taught because i am not a very fast learner i saw my mentors taking time uh the way they explained the concepts the way they got into the fundamentals of the concept i could have taken into you into moving pictures straight away today you know i could have shown you a couple of films and i was like this is how films work and you know this is what it is and uh, if you understand it great and if you don't go read some books but why did i talk about you know still images why did i talk about composition of still images why did i talk about that there's pictures and individual components and those individual components then become a full picture so your mind is reading things in different ways the purpose of that is to break down things to simplify things because that's how i was taught that learn the basics first understand what is the nuts and bolts after that you can interpret it whichever way you like then all the knowledge okay. that you gain helps you to interpret things okay sir so we have a very interesting question coming here from a participant called ruti yeah uh, i would request ruti to you know kind of come online and uh, uh vrithi if you could please unmute yourself and ask it on live camera please you can put your camera on please and you can ask thank you thank you vrithi yes sir uh, sir like, i would okay, like vrithi. to know if is it hi vrithi hi sir i would just like to know that is animation always like a series of drawings because i have seen some in some movies they act they shoot it with real actors and then the end the movie ends up like the whole entire movie is animated yes how do they do that well uh, so, so sorry sir sorry to interrupt yes. you here uh, vrithi i am so happy that you have asked uh, this question uh, the first collaboration the first professional collaboration which me and tony sir had uh, more than 20 years ago uh, was an advertising film uh, which had a mix of live action which means that real actors real people real objects and a cartoon character so uh, so it is so wonderful that you have asked this question because our association between me and tony sir goes back with this very particular question that you have asked uh, so thank you over to tony sir now yes and it's a lovely question ruti i'm glad that you kind of noticed this uh, uh, you know phenomena uh, what you're saying is absolutely true it is animation does not limit itself to only drawings uh understand what is animation animation means giving life yeah so uh let me let me uh, quickly you know show you an example and, and probably uh, I'm, i'm sorry i'm doing this uh, amitabh but this is uh, the best way to explain something like this you know here is a film that i want you to see which i shot on my dining table this is not drawings okay watch that's it it's it's just an eraser coming to life you know it comes out of the screen comes and stands up and then faints now this again is following the same concept frame by frame so all i have done in this film is i have taken individual you know frames 
we are taking individual still positions and we are capturing those still positions over a period of time right so i am shooting the uh, you know let's uh, let me just pick up an eraser i am shooting the eraser here all right next frame i go here then i go here then i go here then i go here then i go here and these are all individual frames remember what happens when i play back 25 frames the eraser moves this is not a drawing it's a live act, live object right so this is a concept called pixelation in animation pixelation is where we use live human beings as puppets you ever seen a puppet show yeah okay what is that um dolls that are controlled haan, by they humans. hand up and they move. yeah and they yeah. move right now yeah. how are you seeing the movement it's basically the the you know the puppet here pulls a string and the hand of the doll goes up right right and the puppet here moves it in another position the hand moves again right these are individual yes. frames that are being drawn for you the only thing is that the eyes are drawing those frames for you it's happening in front of you but they are still individual positions so we use a live you know person and you make him stand like a drawing and you say okay now i want you to take off your specs that is the action but i want you to do it as if i do it in steps so i say okay frame 1 i do this frame 2 frame 3 frame 4 frame 5 frame 6 frame 7 frame 8 now eight frames of my specs have gone out that's how it's been shot when i played back what happens 25 frames specs come off so what you are doing here you are using a live person and you instruct that live person to behave like a puppet so what is important the person has to understand the complete action what is the action here i have to take off my specs so in a live action footage what would happen amitabh would stand and say action and i'd go that the camera is running it will get recorded right but here i will tell amitabh i said amitabh one frame only so he is waiting with the trigger and i say action the actor does this and he goes click amitabh clicks one frame then i say next frame click next frame click next frame click next frame click that's how we are shooting using a live person but we are creating the illusion of movement now why do we do this you know you may ask why would you want to do this this is just an action of taking the specs off right um, so why would i want to use a you know a, a person to do this have you ever seen a film let me give you an example see a film called neighbors it's okay. normal mclaren look for it on the on youtube you'll get it norman mclaren is one of the gods of uh, stop motion photography okay he uses uh, he's made this lovely film called neighbors and you will understand why you would use a technique like this imagine a person jumping up in the air and remaining up in the air with his legs up in the air and traveling from left to right in screen can you do that in live action no 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 so how would it's i do it in animation i will say okay amitabh be ready actor be ready now what is amitabh going to do the minute his legs go up in the air he has to capture that frame all right so first frame jump capture second frame jump capture third frame jump capture fourth frame jump capture fifth frame jump capture now what's happening we have got five frames of this character suspended in air in different positions correct clear till here yeah okay now we are play them back what's going to happen no legs watch mommy no legs <laughs> that's the power of animation that's the power of using frame by frame because you can do frame by frame you can make him fly he doesn't need to use his legs anymore to travel from left to screen to right frame you can't do that in live action unless of course you chop his legs off i am going to be a very happy actor then <laughs> i hope that clears oh, it out okay yes please yes, yes please thank you sir thank you so much for such a valuable time and uh, such precious uh, learning points which i feel that Uh, most of our participants must have uh, absorbed so uh, tony sir i would again thank you very much 
uh, it's just been an honor and uh, it has really... been uh, it has been my pleasure to meet uh, such lovely people um, i'm uh, you know i i wish we had a lot more time uh, because it's always exciting to meet uh, fresh minds uh, here is a little bit of advice that i will give you before i go away uh, watch films that's all i can tell you it's a lovely thing to do uh, and if somebody tells you at home why are you watching films stay you're doing research <laughs> so the more films you watch the more stories you watch uh, the more animation films you watch it's such a lovely medium and such a fantastic medium there is so much that you can do with it uh, that the sky is the limit in fact uh, you know nothing can hold you back and if you like to draw if you like to express yourself using the medium of films uh, understand this it's all about frame by frame there is no other rocket science no other technology behind it it is all frame by frame so what you put in that frame how you sequence those sequence those frames how you position the information in the frames is what is going to ultimately play back for your audiences so have fun be safe and uh, you know it was a pleasure to be here with all of you and uh, i am looking forward to all your questions and if i can uh, you know answer them in whatever way i will definitely try and do that thank you so much awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.